everybody is back. No, it's going to be actually be a bit easier than this morning. There will be more of a lecture and less of things that you really fully have to pay attention to. So the talk will be in detail. The talk will be about polarity with DKIST. So a very rough introduction, very short, how polarimetry is going to be done with the telescope, how we're going to calibrate it. Yes, it should be on. And since Jana asked for it, there might be some people that do not know about polarimetry. I don't know who never did polarimetry by himself. Hands up. One, two. Who did polarimetry by himself calibrating data? One. OK, so it will be ultra short. Maybe it covers the essentials. I will shortly describe how the polarimetry, polarimetric observations will be done with the DKIST instrumentation, how we plan to calibrate the polarimetric data, and then there is more or less only two points that might be on something that you have in level two data or level one data products. One thing is just what are the generic error sources in polarimetry, and more or less the only thing for the exercise, how to detect and remove residual crosstalk if you have something in the data which has not been corrected in the right way. And one thing which I put in is to say, if you want to do polarimetry, the most important thing is to reach a good signal to noise. And then actually something that you have to take into account already when you specify your observation settings. If you, for example, <coughs> put the exposure times too short, there is nothing that you can do afterwards with the data to improve the signal to noise. So that is more or less one point you really have to consider if you set up an observing proposal, if you want to do polarimetry, that actually has an impact on which settings you should choose. So the ultra short introduction to polarimetry. <coughs> polarimetry, what does it mean? It means you determine the polarization state of the light. The reason why we do it more or less in solar physics, also in astrophysics in general, it usually allows you to infer magnetic fields. The reason is polarimetry or the polarization state usually means there is some preferred oscillation direction of the magnetic field. If you have some uh, of the electromagnetic field, the was right. If you have a sort of an isotropic atmosphere, no direction is preferred. You do not expect to get any polarization state preferred because everything is equal. As soon as you introduce magnetic field lines, they have a preferred direction. They always have to go from one point to the another point, and that means <coughs> in the medium where you get the radiation from, you break the isotropy. There is one direction which is different from all the others, which is <coughs> along the magnetic field lines. And that is something that you can then use in the other way around. If you measure the polarization state, you can infer what is the property of that magnetic field because it changes polarization in a certain way. If you want to really derive it yourself, <coughs> in principle it's halfway easy. You can start with a generic electromagnetic wave, oscillation or propagation in the z-axis, oscillation in x and y with the electrical field. Then you have what is called the propagator, which has the frequency and the phase. And what one can do with relatively short computation, one can get rid of the temporal dependence and one ends up with what is called the Stokes parameters. In principle that are four different numbers and they fully characterize the polarization state of the light. What one usually uses is... Which one? They are both should be switched on. I can prove it. <laughs> it's not me. Technical assistance. The Windows procedure. Okay, switch it off, switch it on again, it works. <laughs> okay, so what you have is four Stokes parameters. They really completely, uniquely describe the polarization state. What one usually uses is the graphical representation. The first Stokes parameter is the intensity value that just measures the addition of the electric field amplitudes in X and Y, so it doesn't care about if there's any preferred phase relationship between them, it just measures all of the intensity. Then there are two linear polarization states, Stokes Q and Stokes U, 
in the Stokes Q is easier to see. It measures the difference in the oscillation between the x and the y direction. So that is more or less a differential measure, but just along the axis of your coordinate system. Stokes U has in principle in the description a more complex form. What one actually can prove is that it's the same as linear polarization at zero and 90 degree, just tilted by 45 degrees. The fourth Stokes parameter is the circular polarization. And once again, if one goes back to the equation, one can show that the, the value of the Stokes parameter corresponds to the difference between left and right circularly polarized light. How do you deal with polarity if you have optics? Once it's rather simple. We have a polarization state of the light given by one Stokes vector. You pass it through an optic, or you get a reflection on one optic. Then you get the a Stokes vector that comes out. And the only thing that you then have is, OK, there is a linear relationship between the incoming Stokes vector, the outgoing Stokes vector. Four values go in, four values go out. So you need a four by four matrix to describe everything that could happen. And then this is more or less something which is important. If you have a physically existing device, it must have a Muller matrix. It can be compl complicated, but in principle, something that exists in the real world has a Muller matrix. What you usually have is if you have optics that is not designed to be polarizing, the Muller matrix usually is sort of a diagonal matrix with only small non-diagonal elements. In principle, it means the polarization state that comes in goes out again because nothing is really changed by the optical element. One thing which is important is Stokes formalism because you removed the temporal dependence and the phase. It's only working in a statistical sense, so you cannot use that one to make constructive and destructive interference because you more or less have kicked out the temporal dependence. For is what you have is all instruments but the visible, the visible broadband imager have polarimetric capabilities. You can use them, you do not have to use them. What you have is the different instruments have slightly different approaches how to measure the polarization state. In some cases, you have a rotating retarder, so a piece of optics that you spin around the axis. In the other case, it's a liquid crystal where you change the voltage to change the polarization state of the crystal. The final result to first order is always the same. You get a certain number of what is called modulation states. They correspond to different polarization measurements. The only thing you know is you have to take at least four different measurements. Otherwise, you cannot retrieve the four Stokes parameters. One thing that is more or less also common to all instruments, DKIST will use what is called the dual beam technique. Once with the modulator just makes the polarization scrambling. And then you have to project the changes of the polarization state into intensity, because a sensor can only measure intensities. It doesn't measure polarization. So what you have to do is you have to use an analyzer, which usually is just a linear polarizer, because a linear polarizer has a transmission that depends on what is the polarization state it goes in. And the dual beam technique just uses two linear polarizers at 90 degrees at the same time. That has the advantage, you do not lose any photons. Anything that is not measured in polarizer one is measured in the second one. And that is more or less to say the dual beam technique. Now, <coughs> what you actually get in the data, and what do you do then? It means what you have the measurement, how you will be getting them from instrument, has a certain number of modulation states, in this case from left to right. It has, in that case, two beams. So we have the same spectrum to first order twice but with a change in sign for the polarization measurements. What you have to do is first take the modulation states, convert them to Stokes parameters. You have to take the two beam, put them on top of each other. That was what we had in the morning. That is the alignment that you have to do at some moment. And then the third thing is all of the optics that you have hit on the way to the detector usually has changed the polarization state. So you have to do the correction for all of the effects in the telescope. And if you do it right, then you have something like this in the beginning, and then really a measurement of Stokes IQ, U, and V on the sun in the final calibrated data. Now, how is DKIS going to do it? <laughs> that is now will be part the, op the optical design of DKIS, but only the stuff that is relevant for doing polarimetry. The thing which is most important, DKIS is going to have a polarimetric calibration unit. So there is more than one CU for the people here in Boulder. This definition most likely was before the Colorado University. 
it's going to have different linear polarizers, different retarders, and that one is going to be placed close to the primary focus of the telescope. So if you have the light beam, the light comes in, hits the primary mirror, the secondary, and then the calibration unit is here in the first focus of the telescope. The calibration unit <coughs> will have different optical elements. Each of them is going to be on a linear slide, so you can move them into the beam. And then each slide has a rotary stage, so you can rotate the calibration optics <coughs> on each level independent of all of the others. And what you do with the calibration unit is you actually create known polarization states. You know which optic you have placed in there, you know which angle you have put it, and then you can calibrate all of the rest of the light paths from an input-output system. You know what you have, we're feeding in at the top. You can measure what you get at the very end on the detector. The full light path, of course, is more complicated. <laughs> so in the schematic, you have two mirrors, M1, M2, that are upstream of the calibration unit. Those, of course, you cannot calibrate using these data. Then you actually have uh, the relay optics from the third mirror down to the sixth mirror. That is more or less all contained in the telescope structure itself. So these mirrors change their geometry with the telescope pointing. Then you have the uh, seventh mirror, M7, which is the first mirror on the CUDE table. And that in principle has a fixed orientation relative to the instrument because everything downstream is on the same platform. Which I believe I already said. Okay, no. <laughs> and then more or less what you have, the actually polarization mod modulation and analysis is done at instrument level. So more or less you have the light from the sun coming in, <laughs> suffering a lot of changes, and in the end you just measure down here the final resulting polarization, so you have to correct for everything in the light path. As we had, <coughs> there is a set of mirrors between the calibration unit and the CODE platform from M3 to M6. The advantage here for that telescope design is that the angle of incidence on all mirrors is static, they only do relative rotations relative to each other. The other thing for the DKIS operation is more or less on the CODE table, you are going sometimes to change the configuration, you are going to change the light feed, you are going to use different instrument, but that is something that will be usually less than one per week, so more or less the stuff on the CODE platform itself is going to be stable in the same configuration for a long amount of time. What you can have in each of the instruments, you can change the configuration inside of the instrument, and that is something that is expected to happen on a daily basis, maybe also two, three days. But it's more or less three different temporal scales. The, well, I know, okay, first, first the wrong one. Three different temporal scales before this one. So, how can you reproduce or correct uh, the polarization that is introduced? So, we have three different components. The first one is for the two mirrors that are upstream of the calibration unit. They are static in their orientation. The telescope is looking at the sun, so you always have the same angle of incidence of the light coming in. They, in principle, only change their Muller matrix on a long time scale of months. That is the degradation of the coatings on the mirror. The second part from M3 to M6 is explicitly ge uh, geometry dependent. And that means it really is also explicitly time dependent. The telescope is tracking the sun, the relative orientation of the mirror changes all the time. The third part on the CODE platform is something that you change usually once per day. So I called it semi-static, and that one <coughs> is called the modulation matrix. For all of the parts up on top, you actually use Müller matrices. Down here, you just use sort of an effective Müller matrix. The play, it moves. So I'm going through slightly more details for the description of the first two mirrors. What you uh, actually end up with, it still gets rather simple. You only need two parameters, the deattuniation and the retardance, to describe these two mirrors upstream. The next part is more or less the stuff where it becomes complicated. You have the pointing of the telescope changing with time. You have more or less mirror cr uh, <coughs> Miller matrix matrices for each mirror group, where it turns out you can always combine two of the mirrors, but here you really have to put explicitly in rotation matrices between the optics because the orientation, the geometry changes. And then the rest is everything that is in a uh, on the CODE table, 
it moves together. So what you can do there is actually you do not have to really model the optical elements, but you just say I'm using the effective modulation matrix. I don't care which optical element actually contributed what to the optical train. For the, all of the optics on top, you really are modeling explicitly individual optical components. For the calibration, what do you need? In principle, it's a short list of parameters. You need the retardance and the deattenuation for each mirror group, which is only six parameters. And the approach that we are going to take is we will just know these values from some approach before. The, <coughs> the values will be measured on mirror samples in the lab. You can actually do a simple or a complex coating model, you know, with what the mirrors were coated, you can really do the theoretical calculation. And there will be a series of measurements in situ, meaning you use data at the telescope. The advantage for all of these mirror parameters is they only change with the coating degradation. So that is something that is on a time scale of months. The modulation matrix in principle you have to measure sort of once per day. And you have to especially measure it in exactly the same configuration as you took your science data. Each time you change the light feed, the light distribution system, the modulation matrix of before is not valid anymore. So that is something that is always be going to be measured close in time to your science data. And the big advantage for all of you is that one should be 100% on the data center, because again, you need to go back to raw data, and you need a lot of additional information and uh, routines just to do this calibration. And just as an, more or less an outlook, what we more or less are working on right now is to say, in principle, we have the model for the polarization, we have the parameters that go in. The biggest amount of work right now is to say, okay, how do we determine the parameters? How can we verify that we can retrieve the parameters? And the biggest issue to say, what is the error propagation? If we actually have an error in one of the parameters, how much does it change the finally reduced data? and more or less to say the range that you want to end up. In principle, the important column is with this one here, the RMS of the error in the modulation matrix. That number should stay at the level of 10 to minus 3. If you assume that usually solar polarization signal are 10%, it means your final error is in the 10 to minus 4 range. And that is more or less what is driving to say how do we actually apply the calibration. What are the error sources? Actually, unfortunately, the list is rather long. You have errors in the calibration process itself. If you have an error in the model parameter, of course, it's going to change the reduced data. You have errors in the evaluation of the calibration data. There is noise problems. Some of the cases, you have to retrieve parameters from the calibration data. Biggest issue is instrument stability. <laughs> if the instrument is changing its modulation pattern with time, that is something you would have to cover. So there is a big question because the instruments are complex. So we have contributions from optical, electronical, mechanical, and thermal effect that can change the modulation pattern. Another thing that you have is because you have extended optics. Some of the optics show field dependent, meaning depending where, for, that, for example, in the slit spectrograph, your slit is located at which moment of time. It could also change the polarization properties. And the last one is synchronization of the camera with the modulator. And when you want to generate always the same modulation states, so you have to make sure you do your exposures at exactly the right moment. The thing, more or less the only <coughs> uh, component where one usually has some sort of uh, influence on, the signal to noise of the data is something that, depending if the calibration is good, only depends on the photon statistics. And photon statistics is more or less what you can control with the settings of your observations. <coughs> the main problem is, in the end, you get the effective error of everything. And if you have really the final data, usually it's extremely difficult to trace back which one actually was the error source. So that is something which is the big problem. Most of the error <coughs> contributions are coupled. You cannot separate them. Okay, that was more or less the theory part. So what is the thing that you can expect to see also still in your data? It's what is called crosstalk. 
crosstalk in principle just means you have a mix up of different Stokes parameters. They should be completely separated, but you have contributions from one Stokes parameter that you are measuring in this second one. The biggest problem is you have the calibrated Stokes vector. You know, this one is not equal to the true Stokes vector, but it's a function of the true Stokes vector. If you just take one of the Stokes parameters and you can say, okay, my observed reduced value is the calibrated Stokes Q measurement. It has some contribution from the true, true, true Stokes Q signal, but there are also additional contributions from the other Stokes parameters. The only thing that you know is if your calibration is good, you expect the first coefficient to be close to one because your calibrated data is the same polarization state that came in and all of the other contributions should only be a small perturbation. The main problem is even if you have four measured or calibrated Stokes parameter, you cannot resolve the set of equations because actually, as we had before once uh, today, you have no idea what actually is the true value. So that is the biggest problem to say, <coughs> whatever light came in at the beginning of the telescope, you never know because you only have it after it passed through all of the optics, after you applied all of your data reduction either. And you more or less have never the perfect reference to say, okay, actually it should be this value or a different one. There are two main effects that differ in strengths. One is the crosstalk from intensity to polarization, and the other one is crosstalk between different polarization states. The intensity crosstalk usually is the one that is dominant, and that's very easy because intensity you always have and polarization signal usually are very small. So the intensity is much larger than the polarization signal. A small crosstalk coefficient can produce some signal in polarization very easily. The advantage that you have there is, as long as you don't go to very special cases, you expect that there is no polarization in continuum wavelengths. Continuum wavelengths is light that is emitted incoherently. There is no anisotropy. So in principle, we expect if there is no spectral line, just the continuum spectrum, there should be no polarization. The only case, more or less, where you differ from this one is when you have scattering process, and they usually only happen if you are close to the limb or beyond the limb in the corona. That one, in principle, is very easy to detect. You just have to check what is the continuum polarization level. If it's not zero, it must come from intensity. It can have been passed from Q to U, from U to V, from V to something, but you know in principle the solar signal was zero in the polarization states in the beginning, it has to come from intensity. So the only thing that you have to do is you calculate the average value of the ratio of polarization divided by intensity at continuum wavelengths. You have the coefficient, you subtract this fraction of the intensity. The second one is the crosstalk between polarization states, and that one is more difficult because there usually you can have signal in all of them. What you usually have to do is you have to put in additional physical constraints. What you know just from the theory of the longitudinal transversal Seaman effect, linear polarization goes with sinus squared of the inclination between the magnetic field and the line of sight. Circular polarization goes with the cosinus of the inclination. That means usually the circular polarization is much larger than the linear polarization because of the square. What you also have is if you have magnetic fields on the solar surface, if the field is strong in the sense it is more than 400 Gauss field strength, it actually experiences a buoyancy force and that one pushes the field vertical to the surface. If you're observing close to the solar disk, that means gamma is going to get smaller. So you have exactly the same effect again circular polarization is stronger than linear polarization. The third thing that you have is symmetry properties of solar structures. If you have a large magnetic field concentration like sunspot pores or even network elements, you expect them to have radial fields. So you have a magnetic field concentration, it expands high up in the atmosphere, but you expect that this one has a radial symmetry. And that one then also gives you specific patterns in the polarization signal that have to follow that symmetry. The main uh, conclusion that you have to more or less memorize is the polarization signal in linear polarization and in circular polarization are different. You do never expect them to be visible at the same place, at the same strength, all across the surface.
How can you check that? And when through that one is a simple example, you have a sunspot. If you say, okay, that one has to have radial fields, then actually the linear polarization has to have a certain pattern around the <coughs> center or the center of the spot. What you get is, if you look at it, you get what is called neutral lines, locations where the linear polarization has to go to zero because now the fields at some moment are along the Stokes parameter or at 90 degrees to it. And that is something that one can easily see in data at once. In principle, what you have is these values where the um, polarization goes to zero, they should be as dark as the field-free regions because in principle, we expect there should be no polarization signal in that Stokes parameter. We have a similar effect in the circular polarization. Circular polarization changes what is called the polarity. <coughs> polarity. If the magnetic field is parallel or anti-parallel to the line of sight, in the circular polarization signal, the order of the Stokes V lobes change. One is minus plus, the other one is plus minus. So it's something that gives you a very strong or easily detectable change, which in this case you see here as the polarity flip. There is a neutral line in V, and then more or less it changes from black to white. The same thing what you have in HMI magnetograms. And it's getting late, so I actually can't read what was in the last one. Okay, so we it. Now the second thing is, this is the detection that is based on spatial patterns. You have here a comparison of a numerical simulation. So that one is free of crosstalk. And an observation where actually there was a loss of crosstalk in the data. If you check the simulation, then actually you see the spatial patterns in circular and linear polarization are not the same. If you look at the observation, then actually the linear polarizations look exactly in the spatial pattern like the circular polarization. And that is more or less something that you would never expect for the solar case, just because of the sinus gamma effect. The third and most secure determination of crosstalk is you actually look at individual profiles. Then you more or less have the effect from the Seaman effect that I made <coughs> said before. The circular polarization signal should show two lobes. Linear polarization signal in regular Seaman effect should have three lobes. So what you can just do is you compare the individual spectra, the polarization signal in circular and linear polarization. And in that case, you see that one has exactly the same shape as in linear polarization. The only thing that has changed is the amplitude. And that is exactly what you expect from crosstalk. Circular polarization has the larger signal. So if you have crosstalk from this one in the others, you get the same signal with a reduced amplitude. So usually what you have to do, it's sort of a two to three step process. You first have to determine the existence of the crosstalk. That is easy for continuum polarization. For the uh, crosstalk or crosstalk between polarization states, in principle we have different options to test, spatial patterns, spectral patterns, neutral lights, symmetry patterns. The thing is to say, okay, that one is the first most critical step. You have to make sure that there really is crosstalk in the data. The determination, usually you have the advantage for I to Q U V, it's easy direct. For V into linear polarization, it's something that one can do. Between the two linear polarization states, you can never do it because they always have the same shape. You can always find a coefficient that transfers Stokes Q into Stokes U because they always look exactly identical. One problem that you usually have is to make sure you want to get the amplitude right. In most of the cases, you need statistics. Your data has noise. If you look at a single profile, you can get a rough guess of the number, but you can never trust it. So the approach that is more or less suggested to use is to more or less mainly concentrate on the spatial patterns of the polarization, because that is a method that is halfway robust against noise in the data. So what one can do is one calculates the maps of unsigned wavelengths integrated linear and circular polarization signal, and then you do a spatial correlation between the two maps. If the two maps have a diff <coughs> the same spatial pattern, you get a high correlation value. If they look completely different, the cor correlation value goes down. And the assumption is if the correlation reaches minimum, then you have reached a point where there is no crosstalk, the main problem of the or advantage with the crosstalk in that case is it's always there 
regardless where you uh, observe. So if there is crosstalk in the data, it works in every pixel, in every spectrum, always in the same way, always with the same sign. One caveat for that approach is that one works in the photosphere and the chromosphere with the Seaman effect. All of the coronal observations is something where the calibration will get more complicated because you cannot do the same assumptions on the properties of the polarization signal. And since I invented the method, I also made sure that it works. One thing that you first have again in the simulations, you see the dependence on the line of sight inclination. If you check carefully, you are going to see that where the circular polarization signal is maximum, actually you have neutral lines in the linear polarization. And that is exactly what you expect. If the field is along the line of sight, there can be no linear polarization. And that is something that even in small scales, in that case, okay, the scale is not there, that is something like seven by seven arc seconds, even for small scale structure, you see this spatial symmetry effects. And the bigger the structure is, the more easier it's going to be. Then what you have to do is to say, okay, <coughs> you want to have to calculate the correlation efficient between the spatial maps. You first introduce sort of an artificial crosstalk to say actually you take the linear polarization signal, you perturb it with a fraction of the circular polarization signal in a reasonable range, that's something that can be optimized. You integrate the perturbed spectra in wavelengths and you calculate the linear correlation coefficients between the spatial maps. And then, of course, what you want to get in that case, this is numerical simulations, there was no crosstalk. The minimum correlation should be reached when actually the crosstalk value is zero. Well, that was a good step because that is more or less the basic assumption of the approach. The spatial patterns have to disagree, then you don't have crosstalk. If you then take, for example, a data set where one clearly sees there is crosstalk, just do the same calculation, change the linear polarization, calculate the correlation coefficient, then you nicely see here now minimum correlation is reached for values that are not zero crosstalk. As soon as you have the value, more or less the application is very easy. You find out where is the minimum of the correlation. That's the coefficient that you have to correct for. And just to demonstrate why actually the method works, Invincible, that is the same spectrum as before. After the determination of the crosstalk and the removal, you see now the linear polarization has changed shape completely. The anti-symmetric pattern has disappeared. With some fantasy, you can see there are three lobes. The lower part is more, is more informative. It tells you really how the method works. <laughs> if you have the top row, the Stokes V map, that is the circular polarization that you do not modify. And then you have the spatial maps for linear polarization as a function of the crosstalk coefficient. And then you can see, clearly see at some moment if you have the right value, the spatial patterns in linear polarization change completely. They do not match to the circular polarization anymore. And that is more or less to say, okay, that is what you expect. Crosstalk has to work always at the same, <coughs> at every place in the same direction. That is more or less the slide that you have to think of if you do observa <coughs> observation proposals. In many of the cases, you are limited in yeah, your sick. Ah, sure. Yeah. So, can you go to slide back? No, sorry, please. Three. No, four. <laughs> yeah. okay, this integral, this Q, U, U, apostrophe, V, V lambda, in a way, you're basically calculating the scalar product between linear polarization and Right. Yes, but you have to really check. It's two different steps. First, you have the spectrum. Then you take the sign out. So you count more or less all of the polarization signal you have in the spectrum, regardless if it's positive or negative. Then you integrate in wavelengths, and then you do the scalar uh, correlation coefficient. So it's more or less to say you get the absolute polarization amplitudes integrated in wavelengths, and then you correlate their spatial distribution. So it's, it's never directly between individual spectra. Okay, but some people do this uh, by, by doing the scalar product between the linear and circular polarization, assuming that one is symmetric and one is anti-symmetric. And in the case of zero cross it should be zero. Okay. What do you think about that? The point is, I believe I did not put all of the different methods in there. So that one has one problem. That one you have to apply in resolved spectra because there you really still need the spectral shape in. Yeah. 
you look at the data with fringes, there is something to say, hey, the spectral shape is not reliable. I did multiple tests to say which method works best. If you do this cross or scalar correlation, still based on the spectra, usually you have to also do a pre-selection. You have to kick out everything that has only noise peaks. So that is something you need in addition. And then you have the main problem, you have the spectral effects. If you use the wavelength integrated signal, stuff like fringes is more or less going out because it just gives you a global offset of the value that is equal across all of the map. There, I forgot, uh, we have more or less 20 pages of different tests of correlation methods. The main problem that you have is many of them are sensitive to noise or data quality. And if you integrate in wavelengths, use the spatial pattern. That is the one that is most robust. And it's something that you can program in a fully automatic loop. Because for that one, you just have to say, take the absolute value, integrate in wavelengths. There is nothing where you more or less have to do a filtering or additional corrections. OK. So well, that is the slide to say what you have to think about if you do your specify your observation settings. One thing that you often have, assuming the data reduction is perfect, there is no error on anything, then your signal to noise is limited by the photo statistics that you had when you were acquiring the data. And one thing which is critical there, for example, for the visible tunable filter, if you want to apply a reconstruction or a deconvolution, you have to use exposure times that are 20 milliseconds or less. We had the question today, the typical time scale or characteristic time scale for seeing turbulences is 10 milliseconds. So if you use an exposure time of 10 milliseconds, you freeze in the atmosphere, the seeing perturbations are gone. 10 milliseconds later, you have a different distortion. That is more or less one limit. If you want to go for reconstruction or deconvolution, you have to use short exposure times. For polarimetry, something like that always is really bad because if your <coughs> signal that you want to measure is below the noise from photo statistics, then you are never going to see it. So, so what you have to do in that case is really in advance. You have to look at your science case. You have to calculate or estimate which, what are the polarization amplitudes that I actually expect. And then you really have to cross-check with the instrument performance calculators, is my amplitude actually above the noise level that is predicted for my settings. There is more or less a hard threshold. If your signal to noise is not good enough, you cannot post facto find the polarization signal again. So there is a limit what you actually will have in the data. One thing that you have right now is you can use the instrument performance calculator for the signal to noise calculation. The expectation is that in operations, when there is a certain amount of data, actually there will be lookup tables to say here are some of the standard settings, exposure times, integration time. Here is the noise level that you are going to get. And then you can just read off and say, OK, my polarization signal requires this type of setting. One thing that you can do for the optimization, in case you really run into problem with the noise level on the amplitudes, already at the time when specifying your observation settings, check if you can sacrifice spectral or spatial resolution. Spatial resolution means, OK, you add up different pixels, it increases the signal to noise. If you sacrifice spectral resolution, it's exactly the same. You add up different pixels, you increase the signal to noise. The main problem is, in some of the cases, you cannot apply this stuff post facto after the data were acquired. Then it's just too late. There is no polarization signal in the data. You can average as much as you want. It's not going to increase. And I believe yet that was the summary. <laughs> now I also uh, have to be very careful. I put here DKIS data reduction pipeline will give you data with an error smaller than 1%. Uh, no guarantee on this. First, it could be larger. And the spec uh, that we have for the accuracy is 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So there's a bit of a mismatch with the numbers. It's only three orders of magnitude. What you usually can have, if you really look at the data, you have sort of a three-step procedure. You can check or verify that actually there is crosstalk in the data, which some of the cases one really has to be careful, because whatever correction you apply, it can make things worse. Then you have to determine what is the amplitude by different ways to say, OK, here is actually something where we can really get a hard number out. 
apply the correction. Usually that stuff also is then an iterative process. You test something, you check the result, and then you realize it was the wrong side. So that is something always to say, you have to double check. Run the routine twice. Run it a second time just to see if it's uh, good. One big issue that is in the calibration is right now is to say, okay, is there a large temporal or a large spatial variation of crosstalk? That is something that right now in most of the pipelines is not completely included. It assumes that the instrument is stable. What can happen is if there are strong instrument drifts or scanning effects, if you move your slit to the full range, it changes polarization state. That is something that right now is still an open question, how big are these effects? But it's more or less on the task list for integration and, and commissioning. Figure out if these effects are present. If they are, one will have to modify the data reduction pipeline to take variations into account. Any questions? Hey, I saved you 30 minutes. Ah. Uh, okay, the simulations, I forgot, that is a standard MHD simulation. And when you don't have to be very specific there, it should be... I would have to look it up. Oh, is it like from a paper? Yes, it's from a paper, but more or less, it should not matter which simulation code you use, because in principle the effect that the, the difference between linear and circular polarization that has to come out in any simulation because that is just the line of side effect. Is there a paper for how to do the crosswalk? No, there's an exercise. This is why we have the exercise. That's two slides later. You still want to do something. Other questions? No. So in principle, the method assumes that the spatial pattern in Q, U, and V does not look identical. And that is something which in principle you can show from principle physics. You know that if you are in the solar atmosphere, you are in the photosphere, the magnetic field is going to push upright. If you have the longitudinal and transversal Seaman effect, then if the field is along the line of sight, the linear polarization has to be zero. So that is more or less no assumption that you put in. That's the physics in the solar atmosphere. The only thing that you more or less have is, okay, here's the assumption the field is not turbulent all of the time. That would mean the field direction is more or less isotropically distributed. Then first you would most likely see as good as no polarization signal, and then the method wouldn't work. So that is more or less the restriction. The method works for the Seaman effect in the photosphere, maybe chromosphere as well. But more or less, there you know from the physics that the magnetic field has a certain orientation, and you know from the Seaman effect, they cannot be maximum at the same time, the linear and the circular polarization. So that's exactly what I was trying to get at. So if you go to really high spatial resolution... You should get exactly this. This is a simulation, so 20 kilometer crit size. DKIS should not get much higher spatial resolution than that one. That actually is exactly the example. You are here already looking at the smallest scales that you expect on the solar surface. But if the fields of the sun are much more highly turbulent orientation than they are in this simulation? You still have no problem because that one is the number that is critical. The correlation doesn't go to zero. The only thing that you know, if there is crosstalk, it pushes up the correlation value. So even if there is additional turbulent field, that one is not going to change the correlation value or it's going to push it up because you have polarization signal in all three at the same time at every place. That just makes the correlation value go higher. The crosstalk more or less adds something in addition. It puts an additional spatial pattern. It's more or less the same as with the fringes. If you integrate in wavelengths, there's a lot of fringes in the data. Your absolute in level in the wavelengths integrated maps goes up. But that is more or less a gray background. If you do the correlation of two Stokes parameter, the gray background cancels out. Any more questions? 
node, and we can go to the question of before. Where is the publication on how to do the cal uh, calculation? It's in the exercise for the polarization calibration. It hadn't been published before. We have never used it for any data reduction, but it's more or less to say we did the tests with synthetic data, did tests with um, also data where you add a known value of crosstalk. Then you can also test, okay, can we retrieve the additional crosstalk that we now know it should be? 10% more than before because we artificially added it in the beginning. So it's more or less the method is robust with the caveats as discussed with Mark. In principle, there can be additional effects if you have the wrong spectral line, the wrong spatial distribution of polarization signal for other effects than the Seaman effect. Then the method would not work. But then you still have all of the other methods really to say look at individual spectra. There you have the spectral shape and that one gets transferred by process. More questions, then actually there is one part of the exercise for doing polarimetry, calculating the correlation, and then there is the bonus test for everybody this morning that paid attention. Here is actually the task, get the wavelength scale for the observations that are used in the polarization exercise. That is something where you can check if you now can do this by yourself. The the point is I actually didn't do it, so I have no idea how close the values are. The offset should be halfway okay. The dispersion is something you can figure out because now you are trained in using the FDS samples. 